I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. 起立，面向佛堂，参加三鞠躬：一鞠躬，再鞠躬，三鞠躬。参加多一点传师：一鞠躬，开班；一鞠躬，请坐下。Please be seated. So this is the question that I wanted to put up on the screen for everyone. Why not debate? What's wrong with a civil, gentlemanly debate between knowledgeable individuals who respect one another? How else can we get to the bottom of issues? <clears throat> so uh, you may be wondering, well, who's asking that question? Um, actually, no one did. I, I made that up. I made up uh, this whole paragraph that you see because uh, I knew that this is the kind of thing that I would say if I were to try to convince everybody that debate is a good thing. I would uh, say something like this. This is sort of like, you know, the applause line. People will applaud or people will nod their heads in agreement. And if you find yourself wanting to applaud or wanting to nod your head in agreement, like, you know, yeah, what's wrong with a, with a civilized debate, you know, conducted with respect? Uh, well, if you think that too, that means you are also mired in the Western mode of thought, which is what causes Eastern philosophers and sages to shake their heads and say that, ah, you Americans or you, know, you Europeans or whatever, <clears throat> you will never learn. You are so stubborn. And the answer to this question is uh, what I will present to you. And uh, I already have an excellent uh, answer from, from uh, my friend Caroline. And so one answer, one way to respond to this question, which I feel is excellent, is to say, you know, because when you debate, you are defending a position and not open to learning, you know, like the story of the teacup that overflowed. That's excellent. Now let me take you through, let me take you through uh, the material that I have prepared to make the point in a different way. I want to talk about trial by combat. This was something that um, was prevalent uh, back in medieval times. Trial by combat meant that in a case where there were no witnesses in a dispute, no witnesses, no confessions, you have to make a call, you have to find for the plaintiff, for the defendant, you know, the accused or the accuser then who do you side with? Who do you determine is right? Well, you don't really have any evidence. You don't have anything. Um, so how can justice be served is the question. So a very old answer, no longer uh, used in the civilized world today, is trial by combat. Trial by combat, the idea is that, okay, well, maybe you're right, maybe you are right. You guys fight it out. The winner is the one that's right. That's trial by combat. And it's based on a superstitious belief. Because the God or Lord is a just God. So the Lord will side with the righteous always. The Lord is not evil. So if you are right, God will be with you. Therefore, the side that wins the trial by combat must be the right side. It can, it can be no other way. So what do you guys think about this justification of trial by combat? Will the right person always win the trial by combat? So as it turns out, in actuality, victory in trial by combat usually goes to the side that is stronger and more brutal, not necessarily the side that was right in the dispute, the side that should prevail. It may go to the bigger, more powerful guy, but that may not be the person who should actually win. 
So what this means is that if you really believe bullet number one, that superstition, then it leads to might makes right. The weak have no choice but to suffer exploitation, robbery, and rape with no recourse whatsoever. All that the strong has to make sure of is that when they conduct a foul deed, a criminal act, maybe robbery, maybe rape, that there are no witnesses and no evidence. That's it. Then it's your word against the victims. And if you are bigger and stronger, you can win the trial by combat. The other person has no choice but to remain victims. So I think obviously trial by combat, the reason why it's no longer used in the modern world is that it's a very bad idea. It's a stupid idea. So then, let me take you to the next slide. Debate. So here's the illusion. Ah, you see, the truth, the clearer view, or better understanding will all emerge from a healthy, rigorous debate. You know, a debate that's uh, engaged in a civil, scholarly, polite, very civilized fashion, where the participants all have a healthy respect for one another, blah, blah, blah. The outcome benefits all. Well, that's the illusion. What's the truth? Does it match up to reality? This idea that the truth or better understanding will emerge. Actually, victory in debate goes to the glib, the slick topic, the ones adept at twisting words and logic. And that person is not necessarily the side that should prevail. And what do I mean by the side that should prevail? I mean the side with a position that's eventually vindicated or proven by reality. That's the side that should win. But is that the side that, that would win, that is guaranteed to win in a debate? Not at all. Not only is that not guaranteed, but oftentimes it goes the other way. Furthermore, even if you quote unquote win a debate, you probably won't sway or change any minds. So one thing that's been vindicated by reality, uh, and I have personal experience with this, I talk to, I talk to my friends, uh, my, uh, my good friend co used to be a coworker from, from 10 years ago, uh, politically conservative, uh, he worked for me, I later on endorsed him for a position, he's not doing really well, but you know, we uh, talk politics from time to time, he's very politically conservative, um, and he has friends who are much, much more uh, conservative than, than him. So we get to talk about uh, the, the, uh, the Bush administration, the, the, the last Bush administration, and I said at the time, I said that, well, it's a, it's a fact, it's a historical fact that there, there were no weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, so I ended up in a debate, so this is like, uh, more, like I said, more than 10 years ago, and I had the sense to withdraw immediately. But then, years from the date when that first came up, it uh, somehow, the topic came up again, and I talked about how it's uh, established that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Well, once again, it, it was going to head into a yet another debate. So, minds hadn't changed. Uh, there were all kinds of just justifications and rational, rationalizations, and that's, that reminded me why I personally would never engage in any debates, even when I think a position is obvious, that everyone should know, um, or you know, everyone should be well informed, I still don't engage in debates. <clears throat> Victory in debates, meaningless. So when you think about the parallels 
between debates and trial by combat. The belief that debates was somehow get you the truth or better understanding or more knowledge, that, that idea is not so different from the primitive superstitious belief in trial by combat. Reality is very different. So, you know, how else can we get to the bottom of issues? Well, I'm going to say, not by debates. Debates will not get to the bottom of issues. And I, I have a, a little bit more to say about that uh, a couple of slides away. But now, though, I want, to, uh, I want to talk about something that I mentioned last time, that because, you know, in my younger days, I had done so much of it, uh, I, uh, what I have done is I assembled a slide. There is like hundreds of debating tricks, but I just picked out a few to highlight to everyone to explain what they are. At hominin, this is uh, to the person, to the man. The idea is that when you can't argue a par particular position, when you cannot attack a position, you attack the person. You know, you attack the credibility of that person by uh, talking about how this person has this particular feeling or that. Now, you're perfectly justified for having an opinion on a particular individual. And maybe that person is not a, a savory sort. So they deserve all the scorn that you can heap upon him. That's fine. But if you were engaged in a debate, you had to focus on the issue rather than the source of a particular quote or one factoid or one piece of data. When you cannot, and when you, uh, you know, one of the tricks that debaters know how to use is to divert attention by saying that, oh, while well, you're citing this particular study, but did you know that the person who conducted the study is a convicted felon? And then, so, you know, and use that as a way to discredit the other statement. You're not really arguing against logic, reasoning, or position. You are using a debating trick to undermine the other side's credibility. So that's one trick, common trick. False equivalence. This is where you say, well, you know, both sides are the same. You know, you do this, you do this. So an example of false equivalence, um, yeah, well, you know, uh, people who uh, are not vegetarians, they consume meat and that kills life. People who are vegetarians, you are consume vegetables and that kills life too. So on the one side, you're killing life. On the other side, you're killing life. So both sides are the same. Okay, well, that's a false equivalence. And yet another way is to use uh, the, is to exploit the difference in proportion. You might say, you, you may have, uh, the reality of our world is that we have asymmetry. Uh, the reality of, of uh, reality itself is that most everything is unequal. You know, we have the illusion of symmetry, but the world is actually asymmetrical, lacks symmetry. So it's never going to be that both sides are equal, but you're going to have people who say, well, you know, one political party and then the other opposing political party, they're equally corrupt. There are corrupt politicians on both sides. They're both bad. Well, that just means that you are uninformed and you haven't looked into the matter deeply enough to form an educated opinion, so you go to the easy way out, which is false equivalence. Oh, they're all the same. I know one particular entertainer, you know, at election time, that's what he did up on stage. He would say, well, you know, politicians, they're all corrupt, uh, and we need something new. We need a revolution. And that, that was uh, yet another applause line. He wanted to get people to cheer. But to those that really know, he would just betray his, his own ignorance. So this is another trick, false equivalence. Well, you know, you do that and I do that. You know, this side does it, the other side does it, they're all the same. No, that's a false equivalence. The Gibbs Gallup. This is yet another debating trick, well known, where you put out a bunch of ludicrous statements, you know, for your side. You make a whole bunch of ridiculous claims, but you do so sequentially, like the horse, galloping horse. 
you know, just keep going and going and going and going and going. So by the time you need to draw a breath, that you need to pause and take a breath, you've already made like, you know, 10, 20 different uh, claims. So you basically overwhelm the other side with BS. So most likely the other side and the audience will remember just the, the last one, the last ludicrous, ridiculous claim that you made and let the other ones go because they can't remember that many. So you get away with making these claims that are unanswered. Then toward the very end of the debate, you may come around to some of these and say that, well, I noticed that you haven't responded to, to my point about X, Y, X, Y, and Z, and that's because your position is too weak, etc. Okay, gaslighting, what is that? This is popular in recent days. Gaslighting means that you make the other person doubt their own position. You may say, oh, well, you know, it's all in your mind. Uh, it's the way that you look at it. You're look, looking at it wrong. Or, you know, you're the source of the problem, so you're not aware of it yourself. You attack the other person's perception. That's gaslighting. So, you know, in, in modern times, uh, and people have uh, used examples like, you know, what, honey? No, I'm not cheating on you. Oh, you thought so? Oh, no, no, that's just in your mind. You know, it's, it's, it's because your jealousy is getting the best of you. It's all in your mind, honey. Gaslighting, to make the other person think they're crazy. Another debating trick. Concern trolling. Concern trolling is also popular in recent days, and this is where you pretend to be an ally of the other side. Uh, you, come, you come across, well, you know, I'm a friend, I want to help. But I'm, I'm worried that when you say X, Y, and Z, that this is going to expose you to attacks because of blah, blah, blah. So you start out insinuating yourself as a friendly ally to get, on the, to, get to the other side's vulnerability. So they are not defensive or on guard against you. They think you are a friend. And then you get to pounce and attack. Variations of concern trolling is that you know, you, again, pretend to be friendly. You begin your statements with a lot of praise for the other side. That's uh, the reason why I object to it especially is because it's, it's phony, it's fake. Sea lining. This is, uh, this is in the guise of, um, of someone seeking clarification. You know, in a, usually done in a civilized scholarly fashion, approaching the other side, uh, saying that, well, you know, I, I would just like to make sure that I have a source for the information that you have provided. Where did you get, where did you get those numbers? How did you get those statistics? And if you have that, you can, you can attack the statistics themselves, and you can ask a whole bunch of, of questions. You can, you know, basically demand source for everything, every claim, even things that are already well established. See lining then you can provide your own sources to subvert the other side. So, other examples, um, you can pretend to be asking questions, you can pretend that it's a discussion when in fact it's a debate. So most of the time, people become wise to it, so they will, uh, they usually get pretty upset because they know they've been, they've been tricked. So, this is what not to do. So, you know, one example is called the omnipotence paradox. This is when you are engaged in a religious debate. So, suppose you have a debate between a religious person and a person who is not religious, like an atheist. So, the atheist may use a combination of the above, pretend to be a friend, and says, I just want to understand your position better for believing in God. So this God that you talk about, uh, this is an almighty being that can do anything, correct? And the other side says, yes, there's nothing beyond the ability of God. God is all powerful. God is supreme, the supreme being. So, and then the atheist will then take the next step in the script. And the next step in the trick is to say, so, God is also the creator of all things. God can creator, create anything that he wants. Is that correct? 
And so the religious person will say, yes, from, from God, everything issues forth that we're all creations, we're all the children of God. So then the atheist might then say, so can God create a, an object that is so incredibly massive that it can never be moved? You know, you just said that God can create anything. So religious person says, well, I mean, if God wants to, I suppose so. And then, and then the atheist will pounce and say that, well, but then if the object is unmovable, then God cannot move it. But you said that God can do anything. Aren't you contradicting yourself? At that point, hopefully, the religious person realizes that what started out disguising as a discussion was, in fact, a debate using a trick to lure him into a trap. So, and by the way, the, the arsenal, all of these tricks are available to every side. So, it is also possible for the religious person to use the same trick on the atheist. Same kind of trick. So, that particular trick is called the Pascal Wager. And it goes like, you know, so we're discussing, you and I are discussing, you know, whether or not there is a God. And I believe there is a God, you believe there is no God. So, you know, either I'm right or you're right. I mean, that just kind of follows logically, right? So, if, if I'm right, there is a God, when I die, I go to heaven. If I'm wrong, then you're right. When I die, there's nothingness. Okay? So for me, the two possibilities are heaven or nothingness. So for you, if you are right, there's no God, then when you die, there's nothingness. Now, when you're wrong, there is a God, but you are an, a, an unbeliever. When you die, you go to hell. So Possibility for me is heaven or nothingness. Possibility for you is nothingness or hell. So isn't it better to believe in God? That's Pascal's wager. Now, there are counter tricks. There are tricks to counter the tricks. But let me tell you something. After years of doing this, I am so sick and tired of all the devious tricks. There are many, many more debating tricks, and they pretty much guarantee that debates will just be nothing but ego domination, not a quest for the truth. And I have to fully agree with Lao Tzu. Debates, completely useless. How do I know? I know them for a fact. How do I know? Well, I don't know if you guys remember, I was pretty young when this occurred, but back in 1986, there was a postal worker who took a weapon to kill 14 of his fellow postal workers. Back in 1986, this is the expression, this is uh, where the expression came from, quote unquote, going postal. So going postal started to mean just going wild with a weapon, mass shooting, shooting everybody. I'm gonna go postal on you was the expression. So it was significant at the time. So following that particular event, 14 people dead, many, many more injured. There were quite a few debates on gun control. Now, they all fizzled into nothing. Nothing, was real, nothing meaningful was done. How do I know? Because 1999, you know, more than a decade after that, Columbine University, uh, Columbine High School in Colorado, mass shooting, 12 students dead, one teacher, and it was so shocking that the name Columbine became synonymous with school shooting. When you say Columbine, you instantly conjure up the idea of school violence. That was back in 1999. Then, 2012, you know, a little more than a decade after that, Sandy Hook, 
So Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, 20 kids, ages six and seven, six adults, all died, mass shooting. So what about the debates that occurred after Columbine? Well, they led to nothing, which is why Sandy Hook occurred. Sandy Hook was also something that shook people up, and this is where the crazy came out in the world. On the one hand, Sandy Hook became synonymous with the death of innocence. Kids that are so young, so completely innocent, dying for no reason. It also became a touch point of conspiracy theorists. That is, there's a group of people to this day claiming that Sandy Hook was a hoax. That's when the crazy came out. So many more debates. Hey, congressional action. How about you know gun laws, background checks, blah, blah, blah. Nothing meaningful was done. So that 2015, San Bernardino, death toll, 14 people. Inland Regional Center. So San Bernardino is not too far away from where I'm sitting right now. So it's also in Southern California. It's maybe an hour's drive away from where I'm, where I'm at. Around here, people call it the Inland Empire, hence the Inland Regional Center. So this one struck close to home from my perspective. So many more debates following that. Nothing got done, nothing meaningful was accomplished. So in 2016, Orlando, Florida, deposed nightclub. The death toll, 49 people. Now, what I'm listing here, these are not the only mass shootings. These are just the ones that I happen to remember because they were so significant, they were so different and so shocking. So more, more and more debates, and notice one thing. There's uh, 13 years separating my first two entries, and 13 years also separating entry two and three, and then only three years between Sandy Hook and San Bernardino, one year between San Bernardino and Orlando, and what about 2017? Well, you know about that one, Las Vegas, death toll, 59 people. So you can tell over time, the number has been increasing. So, is there going to be more debates? Of course. Will those additional debates lead to meaningful action? No. If meaningful action is taken, it won't be because of the debates. It will be because of other actions that we take. So that's what I want to say about debates for now. I hope you can see from a historical perspective, from analyzing the nature of debates itself, the reason why I personally will never debate, never again, for any reason. Doesn't matter how other people try to draw me in. And I think the people who engage in debates are the ones who do not understand the doubt. I don't care what their excuses are, how they rationalize or justify it. Maybe they do it for entertainment, whatever. I think it's a, I think it's a waste of time, and I have to admit the people who still cannot figure out that debates are not a great idea, I tend to regard them with that in mind. I tend to think of them remembering that, oh, this is a person who still engages in debates. I'll make a note of it. Now I understand the kind of person they are. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. 起立，面向佛堂，持架三鞠躬，一鞠躬，再鞠躬，三鞠躬，持架各位顶传师一鞠躬，结班一鞠躬。
We're done, everybody. Thank you so much.